starting yet. So <laughs> it's always interesting to hear yourself on, on uh, you know, sound. Uh, I don't think anybody likes yeah. their own voice, but no, no, not at all. Um, we, like I said, we do have nine minutes now. Um, do you want to go grab something to drink or do you want me to ask you a couple of questions? Um, like I've been doing everyone else. Well, uh, why don't we just relax, let everybody go ahead and do other things and then I'll get started at, at uh, in nine minutes. All right. Well, we'll come back in about nine minutes. And I'll introduce you and then you can take it away. For those that are on the live stream, we will be starting the next talk in about eight minutes. So go grab something to drink, make yourself comfortable, walk around. We'll be back shortly.
And we're on the three minute countdown. Um, and we will be starting shortly. And if there's any generic questions, I've, I've gotten a few um, that have come in um, that you'd like for me to ask speakers who are willing. Um, if any of you all have, you know, just like any type of question, like the one that I was just asked to ask some of the speakers is if there was anything that you could change about Zeke, what would it be? So questions like that, if you have those um, and as time allows, I will definitely add that to my list of, of questions for the speakers who have agreed to uh, sort of do a, a kamikaze style interview session um, between talks. So uh, just either slack them to me personally or drop them into the um, Zeke Week 21 channel. James, we've got about two minutes, and I think with that, um, we'll, we'll get set up here in just a second. James, I want to say thank you to you for one, reaching out to the project to get some more information and invite people to participate, um, you know, in your study and the, and the things that you all are doing and for, um, you know, presenting to the community and sharing um, that that um, webinar with, with the community, what, about a month ago now, I think, uh, maybe a little longer, time all kinds, uh, I think pandemic time, this all runs together, so it's just all days that end in Y and somewhere on the 24 hour continuum. So um, you, uh, you, you've you done some interesting work and I wanna give you the opportunity uh, to tell folks a little bit about you and not just bad random, but uh, you know, your background a little bit uh, and all of that. So with that, welcome folks to Zeke Week 2021, day two, we're on talk five. Uh, we have James Hughes, and he's going to be talking about bad random TLS in the wild. And with that, James, take it away. The floor is yours. Right. Hello. Hello, everyone. And I'm enjoying this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm a PhD candidate from uh, the University of California, Santa Cruz, the uh, basket engineering organization. Um, and and my what I've been working on is trying to identify whether or not TLS in use in reality is as secure as we all think it is. There are proofs of security that TLS is secure, but that's really a proof of the recipe of TLS, not the implementations themselves. There, there have been, um, there are many projects out there that uh, have found uh, bad random numbers. Uh, you know, this goes back to 1996 when the Netscape flaw where, where it, they found out that, that that Netscape at that time only had about 16 bits of entropy in their uh, random number generators and that um, uh, it took a, two minutes on a, on a normal machine to um, reverse the um, TLS session or the SS, SSL session. And then we have cases in, 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 in 2006 and 2014 where the uh, dual elliptic curve um, a DRBG, deterministic random bit generator, these acronyms, um, where where it was intentionally made, mistakes were made. In 2012, uh, a paper I I was a, an author on uh, published that 28,000 RSA public keys had no secure had no privacy, um, offered no security, and and and. The analysis that has gone on since then is that the number went from 28,000 public keys then to over 400,000 public keys now. So there is uh, issues that, that people need to do and the quality of random numbers is important. This is student funded research and it's independent of any employer. TLS requires that 32 bits, to 32 bytes, 256 bits of raw random information be placed in the client hello and the server hello messages. 
in 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 early days, some cryptographers, myself included, were concerned. Uh, but of course, NIST has standards to basically tell you how to make a random number generator and to make it secure. But the question is, are those uh, um, are those followed? Uh, are they implemented correctly? And for everybody that wants wants to understand that uh, a, a a PRNG, a pseudo random number generator, takes a seed which is supposed to have entropy in it and stretches that into a long list of random numbers that are used for, for many things. And in TLS, most implementations that supply this random number also supply the random numbers that are used for the private keys. That's an important fact that you need to understand that the random numbers that are being shown to you in, in the messages are also the random numbers that were used are, is the same random number generator that also uh, created the, the secret keys that, that separate you from the attackers. And a PRNG fails if the seed is used multiple times because it creates the same sequence. And this, the algorithm fails if it's not indistinguishable from random. It should look random and sometimes it doesn't. So what we did was uh, the researchers we went to uh, UC Santa Cruz IT department, asked them if we could uh, get a feed of, of the traffic. Uh, we currently get during during school hours between 1,200 and 1,300 TLS sessions per second. Uh, and we basically collect the information. Nothing, we are very, very careful not to collect anything that's personally identifiable. That allows us to uh, have a lot uh, more flexibility with storing and processing this information. Uh, specifically, we, co we, we collect the time of day, the TLS finger bit. This is the JA3, JA3S fingerprints of the client and server implementations. The JA3 and the JA3S basically are um, um, plugins for Zeek that, that can tell you what the app, uh, the, that the, tell you what the implementation is. Specifically, there are so many options in TLS, the probability that any two implementations chooses the same set of options is minuscule, which is, I think, a real major problem with the TLS protocol itself. We also save the client and server hello random values. We save the SNI, which is the server name indication, which is a, a message from the client to the server saying, well, well, which, which host do you really want to talk to? Whose certificate do you want to see? And we also save the IP address. Now we don't have the information on the client at all, but we might be able to, and sometimes we are able to guess who the um, who the who the traffic is from by seeing where they go to. So what we do is uh, basically the internal router at UC Santa Cruz um, sends the data to Zeke. Zeke has a a a plugin that gets uh, SSL established messages where it takes these, these fields and creates a UDP packet, sends it to a, a host that stores them. Now, we noticed very early on in our testing that the entire 28 bytes, the, the random field is 32 bytes. We throw away the first four bytes because they might be a timestamp. So we throw those away. That leaves 28 bytes of numbers that should be absolutely random. and we found that these numbers repeated. The probability after looking at a billion TLS connections, the probability that any two of these connections came up with the same random number is 10 to the minus 50. That number is so small, it's the fact that any repeats is evidence that the random number generator is not random. So what we did was we brought all the traffic and created a bloom filter with a three-stage bloom filter that, that looked at the data. We Anything that passed that filter, we then kept as candidate duplicates. We ran it through the filter another time to get real duplicates, and we can verify that we have no false positives, no false negatives. Uh, we then take that information and put it through a post-processor that, that creates graphs or graphs like this. These, these graphs where the red ovals are random numbers that have been repeated. On the edge there, you can see a number, uh, which is the number of times it repeated. 
Um, the green oval in the center there is the client implementation fingerprint and the blue oval is the server. So this is a case where someone has a low entropy random number generator that is repeating its random numbers going between these two services uh, from this client to that server. What we looked at this, this is five months worth of data. And basically we were able to find distinct clusters. Each of these distinct clusters were, were self-contained. They, they One cluster other than this cluster here, which I'll explain later, which I will not explain later. I'll explain in a, in a longer version of this talk I explain. Um, basically shows that there is some clustering going on most of the time centered around a single random number that is repeated by a group of clients or, or uh, um, uh, let me see, here's a case where, where multiple random numbers have, have a small number of, of services. So basically each of these um, clusters can be analyzed to say, to, to, to determine the root cause to see what's going on. I'm gonna talk about two of them today. Uh, one of them is something called CYA SSL. This is an open source TLS implementation. And it's valuable because um, uh, this vendor here, um, I'm assuming that you can see my mouse. Um, this vendor here, this is redacted, contacted, we contacted them, they contacted us and actually said that we know exactly what it is. It is a routine in, in CYA SSL called Generate Seed, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, there was also another vendor with exactly the same random number. This is the random number right here. That exactly same random number. There are 442 connections, this one company, an air purifier company, and an online alcohol treatment company all had the same random number. But the fact is, what this is, is uh, the seed is constant. Here, for those of you that know C, I'll give you a few seconds to, uh, I'll give you a few seconds to um, think about this. You know, this is, a, this is a job interview question. What's wrong with this routine? Now, this is just a stub. This was intentionally put in there for a specific piece of hardware. And they have a warning that says, yeah, just for testing, use this. But we have at least three vendors where that escaped that escaped and they basically had a machine that was creating, every time there was a new TLS session, it was creating a constant as a seed. Now, given this constant as a seed, knowing this value here, you can pull, you can, you can go to this open source website and determine what the private keys are, uh, what the, what the, what the uh, ephemeral key material is. And, and, and this implementation offered no security. Another one ended up being a very large cluster with lots and lots of repeated random numbers around two, two, two client implementations and one server implementation. And we, we use the word Google and it's not because it's a Google device. We don't know what kind of device this is. This could be any number of vendors and devices, but the devices went to connectivity check, dl.google, which is I believe download embedded assistant at Google, which implies, what is this? A, hey, Google device, I don't know. Um, FCM Play and Google APIs. So this is, this is a device that is currently going to these Google um, um, servers. Uh, of 500,000 connections, only 42,000 had individual random numbers that did not repeat. 90% of the numbers that they used repeated. They had approximately uh, this point right here, here, I'm sorry, here, 1,120 different random numbers repeated eight times and one random number out here repeated 306 times. This implies to me that what this is, it starts with a, it starts with a constant seed then over time gains entropy. Um, it seems like that. We have no idea. We don't know what device is, device this is. So it's sort of um, opaque to us at, at this time. These are the repeated numbers. Uh, basically, here's the number that's repeated 306 times. Uh, this number was repeated 150, so on and so forth. Uh, and, and you can basically 
what I would like people to do, if anybody on in this, um, ha anybody has access to their SSL logs and they maintain the hello random field in their SSL logs, because some people don't, some people remove them because they don't compress well. But if you do have that information, if you could Google, if you could, if, if you could grep for these values and let me know, that would be great because um, in what I do at, at Santa Cruz, we get a limited amount of information. I'm a researcher. I don't have any PII. I cannot go back and touch where this traffic came from. I'm hoping somebody else might, might have more information than, than I do. We uh, told Google about this um, and their response was matching logs will be difficult. Plus they did not determine that you can read it. But in the positive side, they said disclosure findings publicly to show that there are devices at risk and to help identify the devices. Because if we can identify the devices, they're more than willing to help us figure out, um, you know, what is this, what is the risk, so on and so forth. So the overall findings of the project is that we found two TLS implementations with low entropy. Um, we found five TLS implementations with zero entropy. Um, and we found one TLS implementation repeating both the client and the server random values. The, you know, in some senses, that's the bad news. The good news is the normal ser servers seem to be secure. The phone browsers and the, um, you know, Micro, Microsoft Internet Explorer, if you know what that is, or Safari, uh, those, those prod products seem to do a, a good job of creating random numbers. It's more likely the people that are in the IoT space where they're having a processor that doesn't have a good random number generator or a processor that, that is you know, just thrown together with some open source software. Um, those are the places where I think that there might be some challenges. But you know, IoT, in some senses, IoT doesn't get IoT doesn't get a a, a pass on security because IoT are, are, are things like a smart speaker in your house with a microphone or a lock on your door that that protects your your house. Um, you know, IoT has the same requirements, and they really do need to step up. So, what next? Short term, um, can the Zeek community help find these devices? that are not providing good random numbers. Uh, the software that I'm using, that I'm, that I'm working with, I will make publicly available. Um, the cryptographic researchers need to understand and whether they can you know, try to reverse the keys out of these things. But one of the things I found out over the years is that disclosing these problems does not make the problems go away. Disclosing the problems just makes the problems go up. It means that people are gonna start exploiting it and that, and we find that, that the number of um, that the number of exploitable devices does not go down after announcement. So I really believe long, long term, we do need a protocol for TLS that is that either works and is correct or doesn't work. Let the usage of TLS test TLS. But what we have today is we have a very fragile TLS that if you if you don't have really good random numbers, you, you might as well not even bother in in some cases, and and there are re, there is research going on, on on how to make TLS more secure in the face of low entropy random numbers. Uh, here is my um, my contact information, um, and I've also I'm also in the Slack channel. Uh, for this this session, and I've also pasted the uh, random numbers from the Google traffic into that Slack channel, and I'd like to, like to hear from you. And um, I'm actually four minutes early, so I'm happy to take questions. Let's see if you have any in the channel. I believe you're in the channel, so let's see. And nothing in the chat. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, you do have you do have some questions in there if you can if you 
if you can pop over there and see them. So one of the questions was, how long of a string was considered uh, when looking for dupes? Yes, 28 bytes, 28 bytes. I, I discard the first four bytes because the first four bytes in the standard say that it could be the time, Unix time of date. And this is with TLS 1.3. The field that I'm looking at is the hello, the client hello random field. And that's, 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 uh, um, not gonna, I'm not gonna do a TLS fuzzing. The, the question is, do you have plans to develop a TLS fuzzing? No, I do not. Um, but I do have plans on building not only building um, a version of TLS that's more secure, but a version of TLS that when you try, uh, go against a certain site, that site will tell you whether you're, you have quality or not. Um, so so that's, um, that's what we're doing as, as a project. And again, if anybody, even if I don't get a match from these numbers that are in the uh, uh, Slack channel, um, if anybody wants, thinks that they have a large number of amount of traffic going to these Google sites, I'd like to hear from you, and and maybe we can we can try to run to ground where this the devices that this traffic is coming from. Jamie, 